I hope you meant what you're saying. Because it's all about Jesus. And I think Paul, the Apostle Paul, made it very clear for me to live is Christ. He could reduce his whole life in just one word, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he thought about it, uh, the eternity, he said, and to die is gain. Mm -hmm. Now that thought is going to be right, we're going to be seeing that goes right through the first epistle of Peter. Because uh, most of the Christians that Peter was writing to, not most, but many of them, were being persecuted and some of them lost their life. And Peter writes to them to tell them to stay encouraged, to make sure that uh, to uh, encourage, the, to, he wrote to them to encourage steadfastness in the face of persecution. And it seems like Paul somehow, I mean, sorry, Peter had some, somehow an understanding that things were going to get tougher, much more tougher. If we understand that this epistle was written in the year 64, 65, after Christ, and that Nero came in just a few years later to persecute Christians, you would understand that uh, what Peter is saying, be ready, things are going to get uh, tougher. And he writes about that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. And then remember that the, the second thing that Peter writes them about is to remind them of the special privileges as God's holy nation. Now as soon as we move into um, verse 3 and on, we will understand just how privileged those Christians were, even in the midst of persecution. And then we need to apply that to our own life. No matter how hard things become, uh, even if we have to suffer persecution, suffer loss because of, uh, you know, of the message that we preach uh, uh, of Christ, we can consider ourselves the most gracious uh, of all men. And like he says there in verse 6, uh, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold, that is, many different uh, trials. Um, and then also to instruct them as to their proper conduct. In a world that seems to hate them for what they represent, uh, Peter says, don't give in, make sure you stay on track. Make sure you live Christ in every way. Make sure you don't submit or you don't uh, succumb to the pressures of society. Make sure you stay true to the message of Christ. And, and so uh, when we turn over to chapter 2, it'll still be probably a couple of months, maybe in January, when, we'll, when we will reach chapter 2. We will see that he, he talk, Peter, Peter talks about the centrality of Christ in every aspect of life. Remember what Paul talked about in Colossians? The preeminence of Christ, the same message uh, given to us here in 1 Peter. Make sure you keep Christ in the center in every area of your life. Home, marriage, society, work, and in a very hostile world, make sure you keep your eyes on the Lord. Now last week we concentrated on verse 1, where Peter mentions these individuals who are, first of all, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. And then that's connected with uh, strangers scattered through the Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia and Bithynia, giving them the idea that they were not there by accident. There was a, a, there was a purpose for them being there. God had, so, and you see that later on when he, in, in chapter 5 when he talks about the church, also mentions this word elect. The church being and the elect one to give the gospel to the people, uh, the lost people in this world. Now, when we looked at the time and the place, well, we found that in chapter 5, Paul, uh, Peter is uh, writing from Babylon. There's a lot of debate on where that, if it was really Babylon, whether it was just a coded name to say Rome. I'm a literalist, so I would think where he says Babylon is really Babylon, and those who say, well, it was just coded to protect himself. Well, good luck for those who were in Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, and Ponto. No protection for them, right? Now say, it doesn't fit. It just doesn't work uh, giving this a figurative um, uh, explanation. And so we saw the place, of course, you notice, notice immediately that one of the places, Cappadocia, 30 years before, Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. And remember who came from all parts of the world. 
15 different areas, and one of them is Cappadocia. Those Jews who are scattered all over the place now come to the day, into the day of Pentecost, they hear the message, some of them get saved, and of course <coughs> Pentecost ends and they have to go back home. Guess who took the gospel over there to Cappadocia? Now, I believe it was initiated by those first Christians who were saved during the day of Pentecost. Now, today what I would like to do, just to refresh your mind, last week I gave you just an introduction of what I call the doctrine of persecution or the teachings of persecution. Remember, it all started in Acts chapter 7 with a, with a stoning of Stephen. Um, he gets up one day, starts preaching away. He was one of the deacons of the church in Jerusalem. And he preaches away so with such fervency, with such a Holy Spirit power that those who hear him, who are his opposers, were, how, what's the word in English, gnashing their teeth? Is that the word? Gnashing teeth. Uh, you know, it's just like, ah, they couldn't stand his wisdom. And the only way to quiet this individual would be to stone him. That's exactly what they did. And you saw Saul of Tarsus there holding his clothes. And then, of course, persecution starts expanding all over the place, Samaria, then Antioch, and it just goes on and on and on till one day it reaches uh, Thessalonica. Remember when there was a big tumult, the big um, revolt, I think that's, I'm thinking in English, right? I'm sorry, in Spanish right now, but there was one who said, these who have turned the world upside down, they come here also. These troublemakers, these Christians, Everywhere they go, they, they flood the, the area with this Jesus, this gospel. We need, and they try to get rid of them. And so you can see through the, through the book of Acts how persecution started in Jerusalem, but it didn't end. And 30 years later, now here, Peter mentions that it's all over the place, all the way into Turkey, very deep areas in Turkey. I'll give some explanation of what that means. But I want to share with you something before I continue with this message. I picked this up in a very good Christian site where it explains the privileges that Christians had in, in, the, in their early years. Listen to this. It says, when the first church began only 30 years earlier in Jerusalem, the Roman Empire regarded Christians as a sect of Judaism. So they're under the umbrella of Judaism. What does that mean? Well, among all the pagan religions in the Roman world, Judaism was the only legal religion that was not obligated to offer annual sacrifices to the Roman emperor. Instead, they were allowed to offer prayer on behalf of the emperor. That is, while Christians were seen as a sect of Judaism, they were under the umbrella of a religious exemption. But then, what happens? Then, the Christians in, uh, courageously began to come out of the synagogues. They boldly worshipped not in the synagogues on the Sabbath, but in the house, in houses and buildings on Sunday, calling it the Lord's Day. They were fully aware that they were rebelling uh, themselves against the Roman Empire. They made it clear that they were not a <laughs> sect of Judaism, but completely different. And with that action, their exemption and protect and protection and it would become illegal to be to be a practicing Christian just as it is in many countries today if you are familiar with um, persecution in Muslim countries you would understand that in some countries it's illegal even to just to go outside and preach the gospel in the street to just give it a leaflet it can mean trouble it can mean even prison so, just like we see in some countries today, it became illegal to practice Christianity. Because that meant, in the minds of those under the Roman uh, uh, fist, that they were rebelling against the emperor. These are rebellious people. We cannot have these people go around extending this, this message that Jesus Christ is the only Lord and the only way to heaven. So, and so by the time Peter writes the first words in 1 Peter, the believers had already um, had been uprooted. Now it's uh, uh, open ground, uh, I'm not sure how you say this in English, 
It's, uh, la veda está abierta para la caza. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the season is over for hunting. These people were unwanted. They were openly rejected. Again, not for doing wrong, but for doing right. Mm -hmm. And they had to prepare for a much greater wave of persecution. So when Peter comes in and, and just openly says, oh, those who are, uh, who are uh, strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, you need to understand the background. Now, this is going to be foundational. This is why I spent like five weeks already in verses 1, 2, and 3. Because if you don't understand the background, the historical background, you're not going to understand why Peter's writing this letter. You need to understand one thing. By the time this letter got to the hands of these Christians, they were hungry for it. They needed this message. It took some Christians months, probably years, to reach every one of these areas and, and to read this letter, not to Christians who had two or three Bibles in a rack, not even a full Bible. Maybe this would be the only <coughs> official writing. And by the time it got to them, they were like, you know, they put everything aside. We need this message. So they were anxious for this information that we have here. And I'm only telling you that so that next time you read 1 Peter, you say, well, what's so, what's so important in 1 Peter that, you know, those Christians were like, what more? You know, so, so when you understand this background, then you say, wait a minute. Maybe I need to pay more attention to what Peter has to say here because I'm going to have to respond when persecution comes my way. And so how do you respond? So this is the point. Uh, what, how are they going to react? Are you going to follow natural instincts? If you follow Sammy's natural instincts, you know what you need to do. Get the bigger bat. Uh, get a club. And uh, hit them hard, just like they're hitting you. Or you run away. You just flee. You, so you defend yourself. You run away. You fight back. You seek revenge. How many of you like revenge? They say that revenge is sweet. <laughs> well, when I see how these very Christians were being persecuted, again, for doing the right thing, for obeying God. Remember what happened 30 years before when Peter was put in front of the Senate? You better quit, quit, shut your mouth, and don't preach this Jesus again. And Peter stood up very boldly and said, It is better to obey man, I'm sorry, to obey God than man. And he just openly says that there's no salvation, there's no salvation in no other but Jesus Christ himself. Now this too was very um, hard for the, the opposition uh, to receive. So what do you do in a situation like that? How do you respond? I don't know what to do. Maybe we should just fight back against the government. They're the ones that are kind of promoting this. It's open season for, for Christians, you know, bring down the Christians, and the government is giving their endorsement. Yeah, go ahead, as many as you can. We might even reward you for doing it. So the Christians could have said, we'll just rebel against government. But if you look in 1 Peter, you will see something very strange. Peter says, submit to government. Well, who was governing Rome during that time? Nero. We'll get to see more about Nero very soon. But what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit more about those who received the letter. When did this letter, where was this letter intended to go? This, this was intended to be a circular letter to be delivered again and again throughout a vast region. And it just gives us the name. This is not, they're not cities. There are actually regions. Where is Pontus? Pontus. Have you ever looked in the map? Where is Galatia? Where is Cappadocia? Where is this place called Asia and Bithynia? Well, you need to do some historical study. And this is what I found, just so that you can have a better idea where this is located. This, in, 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 again, if you look in the, in, in the internet, in good web, in Christian websites, this is what they say. It refers to a region we know as modern day Turkey. When I saw that, I said, well, just about a year ago, I was in Turkey. And the bus drove all the way from Istanbul all the way to Cappadocia. That's about 700 kilometers. 
it take us it took us all day to do that traveling i wonder how much it took these believers to go all over the place it, it, it continues saying in the new testament the, the geographical term is asia minor well why did they call it asia minor well it seems like asia minor is a more historical term that does not appear as frequently in modern usage as it did in the ancient Hellenic and Roman worlds. It has been used primarily to refer to the Anatolian Peninsula, which the Greeks originally called Asia. It is the outmost Vogue, D U L G E, a Vogue in Asia, which, which makes up most of the present day Turkey. Most of the present day Turkey. So, John. Imagine you're back there with Peter. Peter has just been writing this and says, okay, I need a volunteer. Uh, you're not going to travel in the plane. You're not going to travel in the train. You're not going to travel even in the bus. You're going to have to try, try to figure out how, you get, how you're going to get there. Okay? And, you know, uh, we, can f we can provide enough resources for you to live a few days, but you're going to have to find your way there. You're going to have to find a way to get there. And, by the way, once you get to um, Ponto, or Pontius, as it says here, Pontius, I'll get ready for you, then you need to bring this and this letter to the next city, which is Galatia. Oh, that's just around the corner. That's like Torremolinos and Malaga. No, no, that's hundreds of kilometers away. Are you ready, John? You, you are? Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, when uh, if somebody finds that you are a Christian and you've taken this letter to these Christians, Bye-bye. Are you still willing to go? And then he says, once you get to Galatia, then go all the way to Cappadocia. It took us seven, I mean, nine hours in, a, in an air-conditioned bus to get to Cappadocia. And oh, Cappadocia is such a beautiful green area, beautiful buildings, everything. So it's almost like the Costa del Sol. It's <laughs> desert. Nobody wanted to live there. According to the, to the uh, uh, tour guide, he says, uh, it was very hard to make a living here. Most of the people that live here were just barely making it. And when you get to Cappadocia, you see that it's just, there's nothing. And they had to live in caves. They, they were the first Flintstones. It's a, it's a place where nobody would say, hey, in your, in, and it was very, very hot. And so, John, you ready to do uh, maybe a month and a half to go to Cappadocia now? Well, Sammy, you don't see my blisters. My ankles hurt, and everything, everything in my body aches. I mean, I've been on the road for two months. Well, you only have a, another year ahead of you, John. It's just a few more months ahead of you. Uh, you're getting the picture. And once you get to Cappadocia, it just goes on, and then Asia and Bithynia. By the time you get to Bithynia, you're like, I don't even want to go back home. I mean, if you're thinking about doing another 700 kilometers back home, you see what I mean? For us, sometimes just to get to church, it's 15 minutes in the car. That's a lot of work. <laughs> and then you mean we can have to uh, sit and uh, listen to a message that, you know, it's going to probably take 45 minutes to listen from First Peter. If it was the first Christian, they would be like, please give us this information. We need this for what's going to happen as soon as we leave the church. Are you getting the picture? This is a very, very important epistle so when you look a little bit more into, into detail i looked up this place called pontus and this is in the far nor north which was the home of priscilla the killer remember that mm -hmm. this is where they were born this was their home and so this is in the far north then galatia is in the central region where paul often traveled and then Cappadocia, which was located in the eastern in the eastern part of Asia Minor, the Jews of this region traveled uh, there from Jerusalem. And now Peter is sending a letter of comfort to these individuals 30 years later. That's where the first missionaries went to. And John said something, uh, I think it was in his introduction, 
that who are the missionaries? Are those the missionaries, the official missionaries that go to these places and share the gospel? Those who the church calls out officially, like first with Paul and uh, Barnabas? Or does this mean, now get ready, this is where I told you last week, put your seatbelts on. Does this mean each one of us? See, when you read this epistle, Peter takes missions to a completely different level. To complete, I mean, uh, you have here people from brothers and sisters from Japan. I wonder if they're here by accident. Oh, it's just their choice. They just wanted to have a nice retirement. Or was it somehow God's doing so that they can reach the people in Andalusia? When you look at it that way, you think, well, you know, I'm not here just to rest and have an easy retirement. I'm here still with one mission, and which is giving the gospel. What about somebody like John? He came to Spain years ago with his wife, and uh, they thought they were just making those choices. But I wonder today if they understand that the Lord had something in mind for them, apart from learning, you know, the arts of the flamenco dancing and so much, the guitar and so on. This is something that John loves doing and does very well, by the way. Or was there a mission for them? And what about those from different parts of the world? How about those from Wales, from those from the Philippines? How about those from Nigeria? Well, I'm just here because my, my country is so difficult to live in it that, you know what, I was looking for a better life. Yes, amen, but is there a, second, is there a mission for you? I hope in this afternoon, by the time we finish this message, you can understand that that word elect according to the foreknowledge of God and then pointing to the strangers who are scattered throughout all these different places and really pointing. The application there is that every born-again Christian, wherever they are, that great commission given in Matthew chapter 28 is our mission. I'll keep quiet for just a second so you can let that sink in. Whoa! And so then you go to this place, Peter mentions in Asia, which included most of Eastern Asia, with cities such as Lydia and Phrygia. And finally, Peter mentioned Bithynia, which was on the southern shore of the Black Sea, just west of Pontius. Now, what does all this mean? It means they're going to have to do a lot of walking. <laughs> and it means they're going to have to reach a lot of people, millions of people. Now, Remember what I said, with the technology we have today, we could send not only First Peter through internet and just by the click of a button. We could send the whole Bible in the click of a button all the way to the moon. Bing, boom, and it's gone. And it's already there. But they didn't have internet. You would say, well, how, I mean, if it's hard today, how did they do it without, without any of these resources? They didn't have planes. They didn't have the facilities that we have today to move around the world. How in the world did they do it? I told you how they did it, because they loved Jesus. They loved Jesus more than their lives. To the point that they were willing to give away anything for the sake of others being able to hear the gospel. Now, this the task that these individuals had uh, was could not be done in just a month or two. So, you say goodbye to Diana. Diana, I don't know where I'll be back. I don't even know if I'll be back. You pray for me. And then we hug John. We share, uh, share some tears, shed some tears. And we wonder, John, if we don't see each other again here, we'll see you up in heaven. And then John gives us a smile and says, that's okay with me. Because this is not my home. If we're gonna, you know, if I long for one thing is to see Jesus in my heavenly home. This place is just a, a place where I'm just going to be passing by. You know, so that with that spirit, we will send off John and probably don't see him again. Hopefully, maybe we will see him again in a couple of years, two or three years. So, you know, again, when you, when you think of this, next time you are sitting at home nice and comfortably, and it's, or maybe, uh, you know, you just feel like, uh, I'll, stay, I'll stay under the covers. It just, you know, I'll, I don't think I'll go to church today. Or maybe uh, you are prompted by the Holy Spirit, Spirit to talk to somebody across this, the street. They say, oh, you know what, uh, maybe I'll leave it for another day. Think of this and let the Spirit convict you. Let the Spirit 
show you that that is not the spirit of Christianity. So, folks, now that we understand a little bit of the background, we understand that this letter was not a postcard, like I did, when, when I, like the ones I sent from Turkey. I remember doing some of my trip, that was over a year ago, and every, every once in a while when we saw something nice, we'd take a selfie and we sent it to our friends. We had, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Turkish um, um, cuisine is really rich, it's wonderful food. I had, let me just share with you some of the sufferings that I had. I went to this restaurant where they had delicious lamb leg roasted and then, oh, it was just, it was just, it was suffering for, for Christ. It was really, really, I thought, you know, that's probably what these individuals had when they did on their trip. And then came the dessert. And they do something strange with the ice cream. Have you ever seen how they serve the ice cream in Turkey? They serve you a cone and then the guy does all kinds of flipping and well, you know, all the up and down and you never get the ice cream. <laughs> Have you seen that? Yeah. And they, they just okay, if you keep doing that, I'm not gonna pay you. You know, you end up like saying you get you can it serve me yet. It was very a lot of fun. And uh, then you know, so at the end of the day it was just discovering this incredible place with all these different things that I found amazing. But I never stopped to think about how these Christians spend their time. And once I started looking at 1 Peter and getting uh, to savor it well, now I feel guilty. Because I realized that, yes, my trip was a pleasure trip. But this was no pleasure trip. This was hard work. And, and this, uh, this, this commission that they received to take this letter to all these different places was not going to be something easy to pull off. They had to stay on track and not fear death, otherwise they would never move to the next city. Now remember how I finished last week? I gave you an extract from a writing, historical writing by Pliny the Younger, who was a Roman lawyer towards the end of the, of the first century. <coughs> By the time Peter writes, this is how the world is looking, even in the midst of persecution. He described Christianity, this is the first century, just a few, a couple of decades, two or three decades after this uh, epistle is written. He goes as follows, Christianity, talking about having influenced all the ages, everybody has heard it, kids, adults, young, you know, all the ages of Bithynia, one of the places is there, the last one mentioned, Bithynia. Both young and old, both in the country and in the cities. Are you kidding me? In the country also? We passed by hundreds of towns in, seven, in nine hours of bus ride. And so these guys are not just on their way to these places, but as they go, as they go, they're sharing the gospel. So John, your mission, you mind me going back to you as the one we sent? Your mission is not just to make sure that this letter goes there, but that every, every opportunity that you get in every place you go to, you can you know, make sure you leave the message behind. You plant the gospel. Mm -hmm. But Sammy, I want to get to my destiny. If I do that, I might not make it there. I might as well just, you know, if I want to make sure, if I, if I want to comply with the mission, I better shut up. Because opening my mouth is going to mean maybe not getting there. So the whole trip is going to be dangerous. Every situation. And he, he ends up with this. It says, both young and old, both in the country and in the cities, so much so that the pagan temples have been almost completely deserted. Wow. This means that the gospel that these believers spread covered more than 750,000 square miles. Now, this is going to sting. And I don't mean it, I don't mean it, I don't mean, I don't want to hurt anybody, but how many of us have given witness of Christ this week? How many of us have given a good 
testimony of the gospel this month. How many of us has made the time this year to visit at least two people to share the gospel intentionally? When was the last time you had, you, you purposely said, Lord, I understand your calling. I understand that you have elected me as one, uh, as a member of this body of Christ to make a difference. And so, Lord, this week, I intentionally, I pray that you will open doors and, Lord, put in my heart somebody I can witness to. How many of us this week have prayed this way? Intentionally. With this spirit of, you know, this missionary spirit. And when we think about the month of November, let's not just think, listen now, let's not just think about giving more to more and more missionaries. We have 12 already. The church is doing really well. If you look at that chart there, uh, in the month of October, we're 15 years over the target. That's good. That's very good. But it's not good enough. We need to pray for these missionaries, again, intentionally, specifically. But how about this year when we go through the Missions Emphasis Month, how about praying that, some, that the Lord will cause somebody from this church to go to another, plot, another area and start churches, become a missionary? How about going beyond just giving money to missionaries and praying for missionaries to become a missionary ourselves? We pray for the day that this church will be fully independent and have their own pastor paid, you know, for, paid in full with a salary. Because right now the church is benefiting from the support that other churches around the world are sending us so that we can continue ministering here. But you know, we pray that maybe one day, very soon, we'll have a pastor who will be fully covered financially by the church. But you know, as I look at it, that would not be good enough. I would, I, would, I, would, I would die happy to see somebody from this church say, Pastor, the Lord has been speaking to my heart. And, you know, I, I understand now more than ever what the mission is. And, Pastor, I think the Lord has really been dealing with my heart. I think the Lord is calling me to be a missionary. Yes, brothers and sisters, did you know that there is a Japanese missionary in Spain? Yeah. A missionary just like you, I mean, a, a, a man from Japan, the son of a, a Baptist pastor, came to Spain wanting to run away from home. He had enough with his dad and all that stuff that he preaches. So he ran away and he came to Spain as a, as a language student, he went to the Maravi, not to the Maravi, just but to a language uh, school, but I think it was in Seville. Never said anything to his dad. Years later, he meets a young lady, a Spanish lady, gets married with her, never says anything to dad, and mom and dad, then has a son. And then the Lord starts working in his heart, what am I going to do now with this kid? I have a responsibility. So he starts going through this and he realizes that he, he needs to teach this, his son, you know, the things that he, his dad told, that taught him. And by doing this, he still became more and more convicted to the point that he said, I think it's time to go back home and tell mom and dad that I'm married and that they have a grandkid. They went back home, presented the Spanish, Spanish wife to the dad. And then, of course, the dad was kind of disappointed, you know, hadn't heard from his son for, for many years. But during that time, he was so convicted of the mission that he had that he felt God's calling, came back to Spain, fully supported by the churches in Japan, and now is serving in Andalusia. <laughs> Incredible. And has a flourishing ministry. A Japanese missionary in Spain? Are you kidding me? But we're seeing the same thing with Mexican missionaries and, and Venezuelan missionaries. The Lord's bringing people from all over the world to Spain. Well, how about from our church going out? Who knows who? But, you know, let's understand that God is not satisfied with you just giving a portion of your income. God is not satisfied with you just giving, 
you know, praying, you know, kind of here and there for the missionaries. He wants you, listen, you and me, and this is very direct, I can't make it more direct, to have a missionary spirit. The same missionary spirit that Christ had when he left heaven. To be able to be willing to give whatever it is to follow God's calling. And until we have that, we really won't understand what's here in this epistle. Now, as we move on to this epistle, I hope I can kind of wrap it up. These Christians are now, in the, in the 32 years after the day of Pentecost, this is the year 65, we see that things are becoming more and more difficult. In chapter 1, verse 5 through 7, it says, uh, Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now notice, wherein you greatly rejoice. Though now, uh, you're, you're, you're happy to be saved, he says. But what's your situation now? It says, though now for a season, for a short time, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Verse 7, that the trial of your faith <coughs> be much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. These Christians will be tried with fire. But as they saw that, they understood that God had not given up on them. They were not alone in this task. But it says that, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So the intensity of the hardships might have led them to a revolt against the authorities and to take arms. But Peter reminds them that they are ambassadors of Christ and that they were there to live a different, in a different way. And if you change over to chapter 2 and read with me verses 11 through 17, you'll see something else. It's, Dear beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, uses the same language we saw there in verse 1, abstain from fleshly lust which uh, war against the soul, having the conversation, that means your behavior, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you, against you as evildoers, they may, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God, in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man of the Lord for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme. Are you understanding what Peter's saying here? You submit to Herod. Uh, if I was in one of these five different places and I heard that message, I said, okay, let's get another letter. I've had enough of that. This is, I can't, I can't, I can't do this. But he says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Now, it is not saying that God approved Herod or anything that he did. Actually, he abhorred everything that Herod did. But there had to be some kind of government. And so, it's either that or total revolt, as you have in Haiti right now. Whether it be the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God. You know what, you want, you know what God's will is for your life? Notice here. That with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of malicious, malic maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brethren, fear God, honor the king. Now, in the middle of such hard circumstances, Paul is saying, hey folks, it's going to get much worse. But make sure you don't give up. Make sure you keep your eyes on the Lord. And if you move on through the epistle, now move over to chapter 4, verse 12 through 15. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 to 15. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. You know what it's saying? It says, you know, you thought that, you know, once you convert to Christianity, things were going to get better. And now you see that it's getting worse. It isn't that God has lost the battle. It's not that God has forgotten you. No, no, think this way. Um, 
Think it not strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But, all together, can you say the first two words in verse 13? But, again, I'll say that loud. I want that to sink in. But, but rejoice. rejoice. How can I do that? Well, Peter gives us a reason. Inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with it. Now he goes from being glad to being exceedingly, you know, uh, exceeding joy. Rejoice and then exceeding joy. So the idea is this, that, you know, don't make this your home. Now some of us have worked hard to have a nice home, a nice apartment, a nice villa, or nice whatever it is, or to try, you know, save up enough to have a good retirement. Amen to that. Be wise in the way you live your life. But never forget, listen, now please, we're, uh, how many of you are Christian? Born again Christian? I want to see your hand. I really want to nail this down. You can say, I'm a Christian. I'm a born again Christian. Okay, this applies to you. You're here for more than just make a nice home. You're here temporarily. You're here to share a wonderful message that does not really belong to this world. It belongs to the next. How to get from here to there. And so there in, uh, look with me at chapter 4, verse 12. says, Beloved, thinking not strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice. And then verse 14. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, how would you respond? Happy. Happy are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rested upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Let, but let none of your suffering as suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody. And I like that word, busybody. Don't just go around, just, you know, kind of hang around and uh, just kind of do everything. Now he says, don't, don't you be, don't you just waste your time. You get the point? Don't, don't just be fully occupied in all kinds of things and missing the point. Don't be going around as a busybody in other men's matters. Don't, just, just stay focused. Stay focused. And he says, Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Wow. So, whether it is living in the midst of perverse, uh, a perverse society, or dealing with difficult people at work, or at home, with a husband, maybe an unconverted wife, or maybe with troubled kids, that, or maybe even in a church that's kind of struggling, it says, um, keep, keep Christ in the center. Make sure that you live a Christ-centered life. And you say, well, Pastor, okay, I get it, but how do you do it? How do you keep this level of performance in every area of your life? Can I ask you a question again, John? Since you're free, you know, John sits here because he likes me to aim at him. <laughs> and since it's close, I can see him better than anybody. When you, you tried your best to train your kids, didn't you? Yes. You, when John and, and Diana got married, they said, we have six ways to train our kids. Fifteen years later, they said, we don't have any, any, any methods anymore. We depend on God's grace. Well, guess how they're going to do all this. This word, notice in this word grace, is found in chapter 1, verse 2. Uh, and it says, elect according to the full knowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace, that is God's enablement, be unto you. And look over in verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have acquired and searched diligently, uh, who prophesied of the grace that shall come unto you. The enablement. And you see that again in verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end. Now, I mean, stay faithful all the way to the end. But, Pastor, how do, you, how, do, how do I do this in the middle of persecution? For the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see this again in chapter 2, verse 19, and in chapter 2, verse 20. In five times, 
Peter's saying, this is how it's going to happen, folks. If you're going to make it to the end, don't think you're going to just have to hold yourself up. up uh, how does, that, how does it, uh, Timothy says, hold yourself up by your bootstraps? It's not something that you can do on your own. Be honest about it. You say, well, Sammy, who, who can do this? I would say it's an impossible task. If I said this afternoon, this is an impossible task, how many of you say, amen, that's right, it's an impossible task. That's right, but it's not impossible for Christ. It is possible. This kind of living is supernatural living. There's nothing natural about this. If you're going to make it through, it's going to be by holding on to the grace, the God's enablement in every situation. Grace, 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 grace. While, we, while, while waiting for the persecution. Make sure you stand. And I want you, I want you to see one more passage, and then I'll close it for tonight. Uh, turn now to 2 Peter. 2 Peter and verse 13. Now don't, don't uh, close yourself now, okay? Stay, stay awake. Because while we, while we see what Peter is writing in 1 Peter, you think, well, I wonder if Peter practiced what he preached. You know, from up here, it's very easy for me to preach this message. But I wonder what's going to happen when I go through that kind of persecution. I know that I will stay faithful and steadfast if I depend fully on the grace of the Lord. But how did Peter face persecution, especially when he wrote 2 Peter? Well, we don't have to guess, because we have it there in chapter 1, verse 13 to 21. Yea, I think it meant, as long as I am this, in this tabernacle, <coughs> notice the words used there, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. I want to stir you up. Diana, how is John when he sleeps deeply? Is it easy to wake him up? I want you to picture this, okay, because this is like, you're, you're tired, you, you just, you know, uh, it's been hard, and I, and I just want to get a good night's sleep, and you fall asleep, and you, and you can't, I mean, your eyes are heavy, and your body just turns off, and, and then somebody says, hey, wake up, it's not time to sleep yet, uh, uh, and, you, and so it says, Peter says, hey, guys, it's not time to sleep yet, I want to stir you up, and he's shaking them. Somebody told me years ago, Sammy, you are very, um, what's the word they used? Uh, um, not violent, but uh, aggressive in your preaching. I said, why? He said, why? I said, you always seem to be, you know, kind of holding the bull by their horns. You know, you get, move on. He says, why do you do this? I said, I guess for the same reason Peter did it. Because sometimes we fall asleep. Amen. That's what we have, what happens to us. And today, folks, it's time to hold you by the, by the collar. Are you ready, John? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and say, time to wake up. No time to sleep. As I am, uh, he says, and, well, I mean, this tent stir you up, verse 13, by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must be put off by this tabernacle. He, uses, he talks about his body as a tabernacle, as a tent. This is just a temporary dwelling place. Even as the Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For we had not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were wit eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from, uh, from the excellent glory, this is my, you, you know who was a witness of this? Peter. That's the day of transfiguration. Peter saying, listen, we're not, we're not, this is not just preaching. We've seen this happen. We've seen 
the glorified Christ. Not just there on the day of transfiguration, but we saw him dead and resurrected with a, with a, with a, with a glorious uh, physical body. I mean, we are, we are alive with, we saw this miracle. This is not just stories invented by anybody. This is fact. And so because we saw this, I need you to understand that we need to stay faithful all the way to the end. For me, he says, I'm ready to go home. And I love the way he uses this. I'm leaving this tent. It's like saying, okay, I'm ready to leave Wales. We're moving to Spain, definitely. With the advantage of not taking any luggage with you. In this case, we're going home. Whew. Finally got rid of that bad Welsh weather, right? Uh, and well, right now I think I would long to have some good rainy weather. But you know what I mean. It's not like, oh my goodness, I, you know, this is the end of my life. If somebody told you you had, you know, don't, don't mean to. Uh, Brother Guichi said some time ago, I received news that I had cancer. The first news, I, the first reaction was, how am I going to break this to you, my daughter? How am I going to break this to my daughter? How am I, how am I, I going to respond? It? And so it was a hard reaction. This is, this is fact, this is true. But then he internalized everything that he had learned and he said, hold on a second. This might be good news. If I'm truly a born again Christian, this means being promoted to heaven. So he kind of pulled himself up a little bit. And he kind of went to the doctor and says, bring it on. Do whatever you have to do. If it fails, I don't know how Yoichi is responding right now. I'm sure he's happy. And we're all happy for his recovery. But what would have happened if it didn't work? Here Peter is saying, I'm happy. My job is done. Second Timothy, Paul has the same I don't know if to call it privilege, but he receives a word from the Lord that he was to, to be sacrificed. And he says, I'm ready to go home. That's good news. Listen, when, when a Christian receives the news that this body has ended, we should look at this and say, wow, what a blessing. I've been to funerals. I happened to go to do the funeral of my dad who was lost. I never had to go through something that was so difficult. I was choking all through over 110 people in the funeral. Just a few hours before that, my brother, my brother said, the priest is not going to be able to come. And I said, praise the Lord. He says, how about you? Give me a few words. I said, mm. <laughs> And I said, Lord, what are I going to talk about? All people were lost. I was choking all the way through. My mother's funeral was different. She was saved. I had the chance, the personal privilege of leading her to the Lord. It was such a different story. There was joy in my heart. There was hope. Because I knew where my mother was. So, how should we look at death? You know, for a Christian, that's good news. Amen? Don't say amen if you don't believe it. I've been thinking about that, about that all this week. If I get the news that, hey Sammy, uh, you only have three more months of life, would I take it like this? Oh, well, honey, this tabernacle, no fixing. Can't take it to the repair shop. No more brand new Sammy to, once you go to the hospital. No, it's going to be done. I need to remember this. I need this to sink in and understand that for a Christian, this is good news. It means that I've done my work and God is ready to promote me to, to, to glory. I'm able to preach in a funeral today. Just a few days ago, I had a few weeks ago, I had the chance to preach in another funeral. There was over 25 or 30 people in, in Frankirola. Unfortunately, the individual that, you know, this, in this funeral, I, was, I had to say something about this man, but he was not saved. Again, you're choking. Because if you never see Christ, what hope can you give 
about him. What hope can the family get? What uh, comfort? But I tried to turn that around by telling the people there, said, you know, there's, I don't know where Juan is right now. But if you're here, still alive, there's still a chance for you. And I made the invitation. We see Christ today before it's too late. And then you can look at situations like this with joy in your heart. Sadness because you've lost somebody that's very dear to you. But with tremendous joy because you know that they will be spending the rest of the eternity in heaven. When I think of my mother today, always a smile comes up on my face. When I think of my dad, I get a heavy heart. When I think of those who have had to officiate funerals for if they were born again, Pepe. Remember Pepe? I don't know if you remember Pepe. Yeah. We had him for a few years. Pepe was very dear to us, wasn't he? Yeah. I had a chance to preach in his funeral. There was, again, about a hundred something people there. His daughters were there. I had no idea who else. Well, there were just a few of us there, I think. But this tremendous hope um, just poured in my, from my heart understanding what Pepe was. Just a few weeks before his death, he said, Sammy, now I need to confess to you, he says. He said, I don't know why you're even sharing this with you, but I think I'll bring this to a close. He said, all those years that I've been in church, even passing tracks at the flea market, I always had doubt about my salvation. You didn't know that, did you? He told me that. He said, but one day you said something that brought, took me home, and all through the day and all through the night made me wonder, and made me take serious this invitation about Jesus Christ wanting to save me. And this day, just a few weeks ago, it says, I trusted Christ and received it in my heart. Now I know for sure where I'm going. Just a few months later, he was gone. So here I am at the funeral. You think First Peter would be helpful for us in times like that? When we can greatly rejoice because we know that whatever happens to us, if we are born again, we will be in heaven. We can greatly rejoice. We don't have to fear death. We can actually look at death straight in the face and say, you have been conquered by my Lord Jesus Christ. And because I am in Jesus today, I know I have eternal security. Wow, what a message of hope. Let's all stand and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the things that we've been looking in First Peter, we've been going through different passages in the book of Acts only to help us understand that no matter what situation we are in, no matter the hardships we might be experiencing, because of following you, we have plenty of reasons to rejoice. We don't know what the future holds, but... <coughs> As we look at society today and how it's corrupting more and more, I don't think it's going to be long before Christians will be persecuted, not in Muslim countries, but in European countries for what they believe. And it will be very important for us to remember the things that you inspired Peter to write. It will not be a time to give up. It will not be a time to give in. We're not, we're not to run away or retaliate or fight back, but we are to live in a way that will bring more and more people to the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ to get saved. Lord, we might this afternoon need to be stirred up, to be awakened from the sleep that we are in. I don't know the condition of every heart. But I know how easy it is for mine to fall asleep and to just let go. I pray, Lord, that as we, as we navigate through this wonderful epistle, we will discover things that will, first of all, help us understand how privileged we are to be Christians. Then, how privileged we are to be followers of Christ and be able to share the message of hope. Help us understand that, Father, so that when true persecution takes place, we will be able to show Christ clearly through our lifestyle. Help us, dear Lord. 
Awaken us today. Help us live the Christian life intentionally. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.